In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at the Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, inshallah, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Go to sirahintensive.com to register or for more info. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As sirah to Nabawiyah, the prophetic biography. In the previous session, we started talking about the events that led to what we know as Fathu Makkah, the conquest of Makkah or the opening of Makkah. And in the previous session, we talked about Quraysh violating the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and how that led to the Prophet ﷺ making the very difficult, yet at the same time very critical decision of taking action against Quraysh. In today's session, what we're going to talk about is basically the Prophet ﷺ departing from the city of Medina and beginning the journey uh, with the Muslim army towards the city of Mecca. However, before we talk about the departure on their journey, there was a very interesting story, a very interesting development uh, that occurred. Something very interesting occurred. There was a Sahabi, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah be pleased with him. His name is Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. Now, Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a really remarkable person. He was a muhajid, he was a Meccan Muslim who had migrated, you know, for the sake of the preservation of his faith and his iman, for the sake of his Islam. He had left his, home, his city of Mecca and he had come to the city of Medina. So he has the distinction of being a muhajid, somebody who performed and fulfilled the very difficult, arduous task of the migration from Mecca to Medina during that very dangerous time. Number two, Hatib radiallahu ta'ala anhu was also one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu He was one of the 313 distinguished sahaba who participated in the battle of Badr. So he is known by the title of being a Badri, having participated in the battle of Badr. Those 313 people whose names are etched into stone and who have been, their names have been preserved and recorded for over 1400 years. The, in, in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, Imam Bukhari mentions all 313 names and he is amongst them. Number, t- n- number three rather, excuse me, was that he was also amongst the companions of the Prophet ﷺ who had given the Prophet ﷺ the oath of allegiance under the tree at the place of Hudaybiyah. لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَيْعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ That God was pleased, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased, was pleased with the believers who gave the oath of allegiance under the tree to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are three major... Um, these are three major milestones during the life of the Prophet ﷺ that were considered a position of, you know, uh, that something that distinguished a person from amongst the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. The Hijrah, the participation in the Battle of Badr, and also the Oath of Allegiance at the place of Hudaybiyah. Hatib radiallahu ta'ala anhu had all three of these distinctions. Now what exactly transpired? When the Prophet ﷺ, when they were making preparations to leave and they were gathering together the Muslim forces, Jibreel ﷺ comes to the Prophet ﷺ and informs him that Hatib has written a letter. In that letter... Alright, 
No worries. Uh, Hatib radiallahu ta'ala anhu has written a letter, and in that letter, he has disclosed the plans of the Prophet ﷺ, and the fact that the Muslims are amassing together a force, and they are leaving the city of Medina. And as I'll explain as we go forward, potentially going to the city of Mecca. Not maybe, there wasn't certainty about the fact that they're going to Mecca, but potentially they could be coming towards Mecca. He has written this letter to the leadership of the Quraysh, informing them of the plans of the Prophet ﷺ. So Jibreel alayhi salam comes and tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi this. And he also informs him that this letter is already on its way to Mecca. And there is a woman who is carrying this letter. She seems like just, you know, an unassuming traveler. But she is carrying this letter. And some of the narrations mentioned that she was a woman from Muzayna. Um, some other narrations mentioned that no, she was actually a freed slave of some of the extended family of the Prophet wasallam. So this was basically the idea, that she is either a, a, a woman from another tribe, or she is a freed slave of Banu Abdul Muttalib, some of the family members of the Prophet wasallam, Banu Abdul Muttalib. So, as I was mentioning, that this woman who is carrying the letter um, is either from Muzayna or she's a freed slave of Banu Abdul Muttalib. Nevertheless, there is this woman who is carrying this letter. The Prophet wasallam he sends Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Zubayr ibn al-Awam. As Zubayr ibn al-Awam radiallahu ta'ala anhu, two of the very trusted senior companions of the Prophet sallallahu who are also from the family of the Prophet sallallahu he sends the two of them and he basically tells them, instructs them, I need you to find this woman, here is her description as given by Jibreel alayhi salam, and I need you to go and recover this letter. They go and they find the woman and initially the woman basically, they stop her and they say, you have a letter, and we need to confiscate that letter and take it back to the Prophet ﷺ. She initially just feigns ignorance and denies having any such letter. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu basically tells her that, look, this is a very serious matter, and we're not leaving until we recover that letter. She eventually gives in, and she gives them the letter. They receive this letter, and they bring it back to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ calls for Hatib radiallahu anhu. Again, I want to reiterate what I've said before. This is a very senior companion of the Prophet ﷺ. Became Muslim, Muslim back in the days of Mecca. He performed the hijrah. He participated in Badr. He gave the oath of allegiance at Hudaybiyah. Alright? He calls him, and the Prophet ﷺ says, Ya Hatib, ما حملك على هذا. The Prophet ﷺ had somebody read the letter to him. And in fact, of course, it was true. It was given to him. The news was given to him by Jibreel ﷺ. But once he hears the contents of the letter, and just to kind of share with you what the letter said, uh, Imam al-Suhayli, rahimahullah ta'ala, amongst the scholars of the seerah, he says that, what Hatib had written was, "Inna Rasulullahi sallallahu alaihi wasallam qad tawajjaha ilaykum bijayshin kalayli yasiru kasayl wa uqsimu billahi lau sara ilaykum wahdahu la nasarahu Allahu alaykum fa innahu munjizun lahu ma wa'adahu." So even listen to the contents of the letter. One report says that the letter had in it that the Messenger of God sallallahu alaihi wasallam is marching towards you with an army. O people of Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ is marching towards you with an army. Like the night, it will come like a flood. Like how you can't stop the night from arriving, you can't stop a flood from just 
you know, coming into the streets, you will not be able to stop this. And then he writes, and I swear by God, that even if the Prophet ﷺ was coming by, coming by himself, if he, even if he did not have an army with him, even if he was coming by himself, Allah would give him victory over you. Because Allah will fulfill his promise. So even the letter wasn't apologetic. There were no signs, no elements of being a traitor. Wal-ayadu billah in the letter. He's just saying, look, you're about to be finished. But it still did cross that line of the fact that the Prophet ﷺ did not want you know, to disclose his plans and to kind of give them that heads up. In another uh, narration, it mentions that in the tafsir of Ibn Salam, it mentions that what Hatib had written was, إِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا قَدْ نَفَرًا That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, has amassed together an army. فَإِمَّا إِلَيْكُمْ وَإِمَّا إِلَىٰ غَيْرِكُمْ فَعَلَيْكُمُ الْحَذَرَةً I don't know if he's coming to you, Ya Quraysh, or I don't know if he's going to someone else, but you should be careful. That's what it said. So those were the contents of the letter. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he hears this, he says, مَا حَمَلَكَ عَلَى هَذَا يَا حَاطِبُ Oh Hatib, why would you do this? You're the last person I would expect it from. He says, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَمَّا وَاللَّهِ إِنِّي لَمُؤْمِنٌ بِاللَّهِ وَبِرَسُولِهِ He says, O oh, Messenger of God, first and foremost, I swear by Allah, I believe. I believe in Allah and I believe in the Messenger of Allah. مَا غَيَّرْتُ وَلَا بَدَّلْتُ I have not changed my religion, nor have I lost my convictions. وَلَكِنَّنِي كُنْتُ إِمْرَأً لَيْسَ لِي فِي الْقَوْمِ مِنْ أَصْلٍ وَلَا عَشِيرَ But I am the type of person, I'm a, ty- I'm, I'm a man who doesn't have the support of a tribe or a very large powerful family back in Mecca. وَكَانَ لِي بَيْنَ أَذْهُرِهِمْ وَلَدٌ وَأَهْلٌ فَصَانَعْتُهُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ But back in Mecca, I still have family. I have children that are still in Mecca. I was able to sneak out and get out, but I was not able to get my family out. And I'm not, I, I, I'm not from some powerful family or I don't have the support of a tribe. My family is basically held hostage over there. And so I broke, I basically divulged this information, I leaked this information to try to win some favor for them, that here, I gave you this information, I released my family and let my family go. And he goes further in another narration and mentions that, he says, وَكَانَ مَنْ مَعَكَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ مَنْ لَهُمْ قَرَابَاتِ يَحْمُونَ بِهَا أَهْلِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ he says, Ya Rasulullah, many of your companions who came from Mecca, they also made the sacrifice that I made. They migrated here from Mecca. But they have families, they have tribes that protect them and the people that they leave behind. فَأَحْبَبْتُ إِذْ فَاتَنِي ذَلِكَ مِنَ النَّسَبِي فِيهِمْ أَنْ أَتَّخِذَ عِنْدَهُمْ يَدًا يَحْمُونَ قَرَابَتِي And what I wanted to do, what my intention was, and I understand that my intentions were misplaced, well, what my intention was that while I don't have a family, a tribe that would protect my family that is still there in Mecca, through this leaking of this information, I might be able to get some favor and be able to protect my family from them. And yet in another narration, he also goes on to say, أَمَّا إِنِّي لَمْ أَفْعَلْهُ غِشًّا لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَلَا نِفَاقًا I swear to Allah, Ya Rasulullah, I swear to Allah, I did not do this as, a, as an act of betrayal against the Prophet of Allah, nor did I do this out of hypocrisy. وَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ أَنَّ اللَّهَ مُذْهِرٌ رَسُولَهُ وَمُتِمٌ لَهُ أَمْرَهُ And I know, I believe that Allah is going to grant you victory. I know that the deen of Allah will be realized. The religion of God will be realized. I know victory is yours. Nothing can stop that. It's the promise of Allah. But I thought that this would be a way for me to be able to, once again, safeguard and protect my family. He presents his case before the Prophet ﷺ. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was there, he says, Ya Rasulullah, da'ani fala udrib unuqahu. 
He says, O oh, Messenger of God, allow me and I will execute this man because he has committed treason. He's committed treason. So allow me and I'll execute him. فَإِنَّ الرَّجُلَ قَدْ نَافَقَ He has betrayed us. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ يَا عُمَرَ he says, what do, you, what do you know, O Umar? What are you talking about, O Umar? In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ says, أَتَقْتُلُ رَجُلًا مِنْ أَهْلِ بَدْر? You would execute a man who participated in the battle of Badr? وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ إِطَّلَ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَدْرٍ How do you know, how can you be certain that God has not already pardoned him and has already not excused him? Because Allah said, to the people of Badr, after Badr, اِعْمَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ فَقَدْ غَفَرْتُ لَكُمْ Do whatever it is that you do now, because I have already forgiven you. The people who participated in Badr and made that sacrifice on the day of Badr, who stood and faced annihilation on the day of Badr, with nothing but their convictions and their iman and their love of Allah and His Messenger, that Allah forgave those people no matter what would occur afterwards. So maybe Allah has already forgiven him, Ya Umar. What are you talking about? We don't execute people who fought in Badr. What do you know? You don't know what his relationship with Allah may be, what his position with Allah may be. And the Prophet ﷺ forgave him and excused him. And it's mentioned that the ayats of Surah Al-Mumtahina were revealed at this particular time, Surah number 60, in which Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَتَّخِذُوا عَدُوِّي وَعَدُوَّكُمْ أَوْلِيَاءَ Oh, you who believe, do not take my enemies and your enemies as allies. تُلْقُونَ إِلَيْهِمْ بِالْمَوَدَّةِ You try to do some good towards them. وَقَدْ كَفَرُوا بِمَا جَاءَكُمْ مِنَ الْحَقِّ They have rejected and denied and refused the truth that has come to you. يُخْرِجُونَ الرَّسُولَ وَإِيَّاكُمْ They ousted the messenger and you from your homes, أَنْتُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ رَبِّكُمْ Just simply because you believe in Allah as your Lord. إِن كُنْتُمْ خَرَجْتُمْ جِهَادًا فِي سَبِيلِي وَابْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِي تُسِرُّونَ إِلَيْهِمْ بِالْمَوَدَّةِ وَأَنَا أَعْلَمُ بِمَا أَخْفَيْتُمْ وَمَا أَعْلَمْتُمْ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and then when you are going out to strive in my path and to seek my pleasure, then you try to do some act, you try to basically perform some deed that uh, endears you to them. Allah says, I know that which you hide and that which you do publicly, that which you do privately and that which you do publicly. And whosoever will do such a thing, that they will collude with the enemy, with even the noblest of intentions, but anyone who will collude with the enemy, then that person has truly lost their way. That person has lost their way. So this was kind of the reprimand and the rebuke that came down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the Qur'an in surah number 60. But the thing that I wanted to mention here, and this is a story that you know has been mentioned in all the books of Sirah, and is also mentioned in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. It's a very notable event, pre-conquest of Mecca, pre fatuh Mecca, the thing that I really wanted to mention here is, you see here the forgiveness, the understanding, the graciousness, and even the empathy of the Prophet ﷺ. What Hatib radiallahu ta'ala anhu did, and he is a companion of the Prophet ﷺ, as I mentioned numerous times, a muhajir, a badri, a man who gave the oath of allegiance at Hudaybiyah. He's better than me, his deeds are much, much beyond what I could even imagine. But just discussing the situation, he had in fact, you know, had a serious error in his judgment. In, in writing that letter, leaking that information. And yes, he had some very human circumstances that he was dealing with. His family was still hostage there amongst the enemy. And he had been looking for some recourse for years, unable to find anything, to be able to get his family out from there. And he saw this opportunity, and we see that his convictions were strong as ever. I know that Allah is going, he even wrote in the letter, God will give him victory over you. I'm just giving you a heads up that you're about to lose. But it was still an error in judgment, and it went against the wishes of the Prophet ﷺ. And if we just think about, we process, how anyone 
any leader or even any one of us who would find ourselves in that position of, being a, of, of having to deal with somebody who might have betrayed our trust. How would we deal with that person? How vengeful, how wrathful would we be? And you, one could even go as far as saying that a lot of that anger or a lot of that wrath could even be justified to a degree. Because this is betrayal, this is treason. You have to make sure that you set a precedent, that you let people know that this won't be tolerated or allowed. But the Prophet ﷺ operated with a completely different set of principles than the people of this dunya operate with. The Prophet ﷺ operated with the principle of mercy. يَرْحَمُوا مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَرْحَمُكُمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ الرَّاحِمُونَ يَرْحَمُهُمُ الرَّحْمَانِ That have mercy upon the people, and God will have mercy upon you. That be forgiving towards the people, and God will forgive you. وَعْفُوا عَمَّنْ ظَلَمَكْ أَحْسِنْ مَنْ أَسَاءَ إِلَيْكْ Forgive the one who wrongs you. Do good towards the one who has done wrong to you. Show some loyalty to the one who has even betrayed you. Think about how difficult that is. The Prophet ﷺ operated with that graciousness, that the kindness, the generosity, the gentleness. We understood that this is a husband and a father whose heart bleeds for his family. And how difficult it must be for him for years to having to endure his fate. And the Prophet ﷺ allowed compassion and empathy to dictate that moment. As the Prophet ﷺ taught us, مَا جُعِلَ الرِّفْقُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَانَهُ وَمَا نُزِعَ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَانَهُ Whenever gentleness is put into something, gentleness is added to the equation, it beautifies the situation. Something beautiful comes out of it. And whenever it is removed from a scenario, it ruins it. In Allah yu'inu ala rifqi ma la yu'inu ala al-unf. That Allah supports and aids an effort that is rooted within kindness. In a way that He does not aid and does not help and support an effort that is rooted within harshness and sternness. This is a profound lesson in the compassion and the mercy the forgiveness and I would even say the loyalty. This is a man who had sacrificed for Islam. And when he failed, or when he, made, when, he, when he committed an error, when he had a lapse in judgment, he was not discarded. But the Prophet ﷺ remembered, he even told, reprimanded Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that, أَتَقْتُلُ رَجُلًا مِنْ أَصْحَابِ Badr. He's a man from Badr, don't forget his deeds. He might have messed up today, but don't forget who he is. This is a profound lesson in the leadership of the Prophet ﷺ. The mercy and the compassion, the understanding, the loyalty, the empathy of the Messenger ﷺ. And this is why people were so loyal to the Prophet ﷺ. This is why they followed him and they loved him. They cherished him. They sacrificed for him. They would lay their lives on the line for him was because this is what their experience with him was. It was, you know, as just an expression goes, it was better than advertised. It was better than advertised. After this entire event uh, unfolded and occurred, and the Prophet ﷺ dealt with this, it is at that point in time, the Prophet ﷺ appointed a man by the name of Abu Ruhm, Kulthum ibn Hussain, as he was from the tribe of Ghifar, Al-Ghifari. He appointed him as the person in charge of Medina, the ward of Medina. He appointed, appointed him as the person in charge of Medina in his absence. And then the Prophet ﷺ left the city of Medina. It was the month of Ramadan. There are different narrations. Some narrations mention that when they left, it was the second day of Ramadan. But some of the narrations mention when they left, it was the 10th day of the month of Ramadan. Nevertheless, it was the month of Ramadan. It was the first half of the month of Ramadan. And the Prophet ﷺ was traveling with 
as Urwat ibn Zubayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentions and he narrates, uh, as narrated by Imam Bayhaqi, the Prophet sallallahu had 12,000 companions with him. 12,000 companions. It was not just all of Medina and the Muslims of Medina, but even from surrounding areas and tribes, other people had joined in as well. And there were 12,000 people. There were Muhajirun and there were Ansar. There were just a ton of people with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa 12,000 around that number. And they left in the first half of this month of Ramadan and they proceeded. The other reason why this is also notable, this particular journey, is as they were leaving, the Prophet ﷺ was fasting. It was the month of Ramadan and he was fasting. When they reached the place of Usfan, the Prophet ﷺ had been fasting every day, but when they reached the point of Usfan, which is on the way to Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ, it was daytime, and some of the narrations mentioned that some of the Sahaba had come and inquired from the Prophet ﷺ that many people are having trouble fasting during the journey, it's very difficult. So the Prophet ﷺ called for some water, somebody brought the Prophet ﷺ some water, and the Prophet ﷺ drank the water in front of everyone. And the Prophet ﷺ showed them that it was permissible for them to not fast as well, even though it was the month of Ramadan, but because they were traveling, they were excused from fasting. And when there were those who fasted, so the Prophet ﷺ fasted part of the journey, and he did. And then when he opened his fast, when he broke his fast on that day, the rest of the days on the journey, the Prophet ﷺ did not fast. So he did both, he demonstrated both. And that's why Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, he would tell the story, and then he would give the ruling, the fatwa. He would say, Sama Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam safari wa aftara. The Prophet ﷺ both fasted while traveling, and he also did not fast while traveling in the month of Ramadan. فَمَنْ شَاءَ sama wa man شَاءَ aftara. So whoever wants to fast can fast while traveling, and whoever does not want to fast, then we'll make it up you know, afterwards, then that is fine as well, while traveling. And um, the Prophet ﷺ would also, you know, issue the verdict, لَيْسَ مِنَ الْبِرِّيَ الصِّيَامُ فِي السَّفَرِ That it is not necessarily a mark of piety to fast while traveling. It is not necessarily a mark of piety to fast while traveling, but it is completely a valid option to not fast while traveling, but it is up to the person's discretion. But if a person does not fast because they are traveling during the month of Ramadan, whatever number of days they do not end up fasting, they will have to make those days up obviously after the month of Ramadan. So in this way, they continued on to their journey until they arrived in Mecca, according to again the different uh, reports, uh, some narrations mention on the 10th, some mention on the 13th, and some mention on the 17th. All in all, it's mentioned that this journey of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba um, from Medina to Mecca, the most authentic of the narrations mentioned that the journey lasted about 11 days. So based off of that, you can kind of calculate backwards. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala prefers the narration that says that they arrived in Mecca on the 13th, on the 13th, and they left Medina on the second day of Ramadan. So it was an 11 day journey. The reason why it took so much longer, obviously it was a long, larger army that was traveling. And inshallah in the coming session, what we're going to be talking about is, they stopped outside of Mecca and over there, there were some meetings that were conducted. Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, came and met with him. Uh, Abu Sufyan, came and met with him, and inshallah we'll talk about all of those different meetings, and what were some of the resolutions that were passed by the Prophet ﷺ at that time, and then we'll talk about the Prophet ﷺ's entry into the city of Mecca, and how the Prophet ﷺ handled that very interesting opportunity that the Prophet ﷺ was presented with. So inshallah, with that we'll go ahead and conclude, I know that the uh, weather's a little wet and cold and things like that, so we'll conclude a little bit sooner today. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasakfirukum wa natubu ilayk.